We invite you to turn this morning in the 19th chapter of Luke. The 19th chapter of Luke, of course, today begins Holy Week. Uh, today is Palm Sunday, or the triumph of entry of our Lord into Jerusalem. Luke 19, reading verses 28 through 44. Luke 19, 28 through 44. And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he said two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering you shall find a coat tied, whereon yet never a man sat. Loose them and bring him hither. And if any man ask you why do you loose him, thus shall you say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found even as they had said unto them. And as they were loosing the coat, the owners thereof said unto them, Why do you loose the coat? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the coat, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that had they had seen saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from whom the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should own their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it said, If thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from mine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemy shall cast a trench about them, about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee on, in on every side, and shall lay uh, they even with the ground and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. May God add the blessing of the reading of this word. As we look today at Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, the beginning of our, of our Lord's last week upon the earth, we will go back and read there verses 12 through 27 of chapter 19 that Jesus there gave a parable about a nobleman who become, uh, became a king. And it's about a king who was rejected and the return of the king. Of course, the Lord gave that parable there uh, to illustrate the point uh, of Jesus himself that uh, the king would come and this would be the day uh, the prophecy would be fulfilled that the Lord would ride into Jerusalem there and make his triumph of entry there. Uh, but it was a parable there to prepare the disciples for what lay ahead. Now it was time to go to Jerusalem. The triumphal entry was ahead. We uh, observe that today is Palm Sunday. His betrayal and trial were ahead when you get to Thursday and Friday of the week. And then the cross and resurrection, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Now if you'll notice first of all, Jesus ascended to Jerusalem because it was his time. Verses 28 through 35. You know, our Lord is always on time. <coughs> we might 
may not think in his own time, especially if we've been praying about the matter or, or whatever. In fact, we may think that his response is slow. Well, it may be for, the, for those of us who aren't very patient and need to uh, learn more patience. By the way, don't ever pray for patience. If you do that, God will give it to you the hard way. So don't ever pray for patience. But our Lord was on time. The prophecies, the many prophecies in the Old Testament would be fulfilled on this very day. He told his mother Mary in Cana of Galilee in John 2 verse 4, Mine hour is not yet come when she wanted him to do the miracle there to turn the water into wine. And then in John 7, verse 6, my time uh, it is not yet come. Now there were attempts. In fact, his own kinsmen uh, tried to push Jesus off a cliff one time. Uh, he made them pretty mad and they tried to kill him. But they were unsuccessful because it was not the Lord's time. The Lord's time is perfect. This is a plan that was set up all the way back in the eons of time after man sinned there uh, in Eden. Now his time had arrived. We see that the 69th week of Daniel would come to pass. Now we've been studying quite a bit in prophecy. And we were about three weeks old Daniel 9, about the 70 weeks of prophecy. And in a nutshell, that has to do with the end time. The first 69 weeks, and, and they began counting about the time that Nehemiah uh, completed the rebuilding of the wall. And we're getting down to the 69th week. And in Daniel 9, 25 and 26, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem and to the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off but not for himself and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. So the 69th week uh, would be fulfilled there uh, when our Lord would ride uh, into Jerusalem there on the donkey there uh, in the triumphant entry. And the text there that we just read out of Daniel 9 says the Messiah would be cut off. And what cut off means is that he would be uh, killed, that he would be crucified. So the prophecy, the prophetic timetable stopped here during this week. Now tonight, we're going to look a little bit at Holy Week itself, all the events that took place uh, on our Lord's last week uh, here upon the earth. By the way, the 70th week is yet to take place. That's coming uh, in the future during the Great Tribulation period. Not the timing of the events that day. The cult was there for the disciples to find uh, there in verse 32. Now Jesus says you go find a coat. And uh, the owners there in verse 33, and as they were loosing the coat, the owners therefore said unto them, why you lose the coat? And then in verse 34, they said, the Lord hath need of him. Now, uh, you know, a lot of speculated how this come to pass. Did Jesus make arrangements beforehand? Possibly. I think it was the miraculous. You know, 
I don't have any problem believing in the God of the miraculous. A lot of people do in our modern society today. They think, well, I don't believe in the God of miracles and, and all of that. And I like to tell people this, then do you believe in God at all? Because if God cannot do miracles, then in my book, he's not God. Now, God can limit him. He can limit himself. And he did when Jesus came. Uh, he set aside his deity, uh, the prerogatives there, and he never quit, ceased to become God. But the cult was there for the disciples to find. The owners reacted just as Jesus said. God's great plan of redemption was right on schedule. Dr. William Culbertson said Calvary was not God's afterthought. It was his fourth. None of this took God by surprise. Uh, the cross certainly didn't take God by surprise because it was God's plan that His only begotten Son died upon the cross. Uh, yes, in man's way of looking at it, it was a heinous act. An innocent man was tried before a kangaroo court was put on trial and wrongly accused and wrongly executed. Now that's man's way of looking at it. God's way of looking at it, the perfect plan of redemption. Now a lot of people have trouble with that. They say, well, how could God, why would God need all this blood and all this gore and, and, and everything? Well, for one thing, it goes back to the sacrificial system. We don't have time to go back into that. We'll go back into Leviticus and Numbers read all about that. And by the way, the times I've tried to read through the Bible, that's what's, you know, uh, sort of stuck me there. But anyway, Jesus was coming into Jerusalem to die right on time. Now secondly, Jesus ascended to Jerusalem to fulfill the scriptures there in verses 36 through 40. Zechariah saw it all centuries before there in Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold thy, behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon the colt, the foal of an ass. So our Lord in his first coming here, into Jerusalem would be riding on a lowly donkey. He would be riding on the beast of burden. Now contrast that when he comes back a second time. When he comes back to the Mount of Olives, he's going to be a, riding a white stallion and he's going to be slinging a sword and he's going to be destroying his enemies. We see here the lowly servant. We see here the servant king coming uh, into Jerusalem. Well, the people would welcome him with joy. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Shouts of praise would fill the air. He would be riding upon an unbroken coat. No man, as the scripture says, had ever ridden this beast before. He was coming to fulfill the scriptures. His birth in Bethlehem prophesied in Micah 5, 2. His virgin birth there in Isaiah 7, 14 would be born of a virgin. And then there was rejection by men, the irony of it. Many, I believe, if not most or all, of these same people that were shouting, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What would they be shouting Friday? Give us Barabbas. Crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Now you see how fickle people are and how sentiment can turn around on the dime. Isaiah 53 verse 3 is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. 
as we hid, as it were, our faces from him, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. And then his substitutionary death there in Isaiah 53, 5 and 6. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes <clears throat> we are healed. A very poignant graphic a picture there in Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone into his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. You know, it should have been us upon the cross that day. It should have been us that took the beatings. It should have been us that took the stripes. It should have been us who's uh, hands, uh, nails in the hands, and crown of thorns, and a pierced side. It should have been us. But our Lord there, He freely gave and bore it all there upon the cross. And this is the heart of the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you first of all, that which I also received, how that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. This is the Gospel this morning. Very simple. To, uh, to accept the fact that you're a sinner, to believe in your heart the Lord Jesus, and I, uh, to believe that His death upon the cross is, and His resurrection. That is the heart of the gospel. Because if you don't have those two things, you don't have salvation. You have to have the resurrection. Had He just died, you know, upon the cross, the cruel death, He would have just been a poor mark. That would have been no, uh, well, let me just say it, purchasing power of the blood of Jesus. That may not be a good way to put it. But it would have had no effect, by the way. But we see our Lord is all that He said that He was. A lot of people have tried to paint Him as a fraud and as a fake and a failure. And man, the, the theories about the uh, resurrection that they've come up with, the swoon theory that He was out cold and that He did just come, you know, back to life and they'd switched His body and all a bunch of, you know, just uh, untruth there. But the Scriptures, they guarantee Him. The Scriptures, the Word of God, the inerrant, the infallible Word of God cannot lie. Then we say third, Jesus says, send it to Jerusalem to die for sinners. There in verses 41 through 30 through 44. The love of Jesus brought him to this earth. That's why he came. The love of Jesus brought him to Jerusalem. Did Jesus know what he was getting himself into? Of course he knew what he was getting himself into. He knew that by the end of the week he would be dead. But he came. He came to satisfy the will of the Father. And he came to satisfy the plan of God. He came to satisfy the love of God, though the love couldn't save us. There had to be there the sacrifice. We see that his arrival would motivate his enemies, the Sanhedrin, and all lying in wait for the right time. And that would be Thursday night when Judas there would give him the kiss of death and when they would take him there uh, for uh, trial. And his arrival would lead to the cross. The series of events, as we shall see tonight, would lead to the cross. But see his compassion for those who will crucify him. Now, there in verse 41, he wept for the city. As he beheld the city, he wept. His own people, whom he come to as the promised Messiah, 
His own people would reject him. Crucify him, crucify him. Give us Barabbas. We have no king but Caesar. And he wept over it. And then we see that he mourned for their coming sorrows there in 42 through 44. That the, the temple and all the city would be destroyed some 30 some years later. 70 AD, Titus would destroy Jerusalem. No stone of the magnificent temple of Herod would remain. It'd all be torn down. Little infants would be thrown against the rocks and murdered. Jesus saw all this. These were his people. Jesus was a Jew. And he wept. He wept over Jerusalem. But, we, and we don't have time to go into this, as we've been seeing in prophecy, God's not done with the Jew. Uh, that's the reason for the great tribulation. A lot of people uh, think that the Jews blew it here. Uh, God will deal with his people there in the last days. Well, the people missed their day of visitation. But we, on this side of the coming of Jesus, we have time to come to Jesus. Uh, we're in the day of grace. And you don't want to wait to do it in the great tribulation. I can't guarantee you will be saved during the Great Tribulation. A lot of people will, but I wouldn't bite on it, especially if you've lived in the day of 